By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I am playing against Eric from Boston. And Eric is a player who is bringing an alpha deck to the table. He's got an incredible alpha collection. And I'm so happy that I'm able to play against him. He's got a deck red and green with Illusionary Mask and Raging River. So you can imagine, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this. I don't really know how these cards work, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to see them in action. I'm playing with my blue and green deck. It's called The Plan Gin. So um, we're first going to go to the deck text. Now, if you want to go straight to the actual games, no worries. Check the description below. There you will find a timestamp. Click on the timestamp and that will take you straight to game number one. As for now, we are going to start with the deck text. Looking at my deck first, The Plan Gin. And this is the deck that I'm playing with today. It's called The Plan Gin. And as you can see, I don't have a deck photo, unfortunately. Uh, but I would like to explain the deck to you. It's actually quite simple. The colors that I play are blue and green. And what I want to do in turn one, I want to play a Mana Dork. So that's the Birds of Paradise, a Lanoir Elves, possibly a Sol Ring if I'm lucky. And then in turn two or turn three, I want to start playing Big Flyer. So I'm playing with a full play set of Surrender Befrites. I'm playing with three Mahamoti Jins. So I've got seven targets to kind of ramp into. Then when those targets are on the board, I want to make them even bigger using an Unstable Mutation and a Giant Growth or a Giant Growth, you know, so just get as much damage in as quickly as possible. I'm also playing with four counter spells to kind of try to control the board. I'm playing with uh, three JM Day Tomes to draw extra cards just to make sure that I have an outlet for all the lands if I don't draw into my Mahamoti Jin or my, you know, easier to cast Surrender Befreed. So that's basically the idea of my deck. So I want to ramp into a big creature bump the creature even more and deal a lot of damage. That's the plan. That is the plan, Jin. So now let's take a look at Eric's deck. And here we can see the beautiful deck of my opponent, Eric from the States. And look at this. I'm, I'm actually jealous. I'm jealous. I wish I owned these cards. It's, they're, it's stunning, um, completely alpha. And there are a couple of cards that really stand out. When we first look at this, it's your classic red green aggressive deck you've got four lanoir elves that can help you ramp out your bigger creatures such as war mammoths giant spiders we've got that fantastic two-headed giant cockatrice and look at that it even has a clockwork beast i mean that is serious power that card you know if you combine that with a berserk man you can deal a lot of damage um also the often trolls are pretty good and there are two cards that i also want to mention here because i don't see them that often you've got raging river and enchantment for two red to cast and what it reads is when you attack your opponent needs to put his his or her defenders on a side of the river so on the left side of the river or the right side of the river now this is only for non-flying creatures and then you as an attacker can decide if you want to go left or you want to go right so that way you can avoid a blocking creature so i think that's just that's hysterical that's um i'm really looking forward to see raging river in action the other card i want to discuss here is illusionary mask now illusionary mask is an artifact you can cast it for two then it reads pay x and then there's it reads a lot like the whole text box is completely chock full and um the card is weird the card is just weird what it does you can pay x and x is the casting cost of a creature and then you put that creature on the board, but you put it face down and you don't actually cast it. So that means you cannot counter it. Um, it's it's a complicated card. You know, with Illusionary Mask, I think I'll cross that bridge when we get there. So if it's being played in the game, I'll try to explain it to the best of my ability. I haven't played against it um, ever. So this is going to be a first time for me. So looking forward to that. Then there are some other cards I want to discuss here in this deck because they are special because they are alpha. And that is Orcish Artillery and Orcish Oriflame. Now, Orcish Artillery is a card that usually costs two red and one to cast. And what you get in return is a 1-3 Orc that you can tap. And it reads, deals two damage to any target and three damage to you. So that is actually pretty okay when you have an aggressive strategy and you just want to deal as much damage as possible because that two damage can kind of be crucial. But in Alpha, there's something special. It's not two red and one. It's only one red and one to cast. So instead of three mana to cast, it's only two mana to cast. 
and that is making the card considerably better. It's a pretty solid blocker for 1-3, and then later in the game, you can use it to push through some damage if needed, you know, and it can also be interesting because with this red-green deck, you want to do one thing, and that is pump out threats and keep attacking. Now, for example, if you've got a 2-2 Grizzly Bear and you're attacking into a 4-4 creature, usually that wouldn't be a very good deal. But when you've got an Aura Flame, you can actually kill that creature using Aura Flame's ability, so trading the Grizzly Bear for a bigger creature, and then all of a sudden, it makes sense to attack. So I think the, or the Orcish Artillery really fits well with the strategy. Talking about strategy and cards that fit in well, the other card that I mentioned here, Orcish Aura Flame, is also a card, I mean, that is even better in this setup. It's an enchantment. In Alpha, it's only one red and one to cast, but act the actual casting cost is one red and three. But we're playing with Alpha, so he can pay it for his Alpha casting cost. I think that's fair. He asked me beforehand, I said, you know what? I think if you've got the Alpha copies, you should pay the Alpha casting cost. So that's what he's doing. And what Orcish Oriflame actually does, it reads all your attacking creatures gain plus one plus O. Oh which is, you can imagine, that can really get out of hand if you look at this deck. This deck is full of creatures. And then there's one last creature I wanna point out just because it's a beautiful creature that is Rock of Courageous, one red and three to cast, it's a three, three flyer, that's what it does. But just, if you don't know the card, look at the art here in this picture and look it up online, Rock of Courageous, and you know check, check the art on that card. I just think it's absolutely stunning art. Um, so this is the deck of Eric. Uh, thank you for br bringing this to the table here on Timmy Talks, and I'm really looking forward to play this match. Let's go to game one. Game number one here about to begin. I am sitting on the left side with my blue-green revised deck, Mahamoti Ramp, playing against Eric, who's playing with his alpha deck, red and green, and he's on the play here, taking a mulligan, it seems, starting with a basic forest and passing turn here. And let's see what I can do. Starting with a Tropical Island, and there is a Lanawar Elves. 1-1 one, one creature, so pretty good start for me. And look at that, Eric also playing a Lanawar. I guess he just top decked that card, or else he would have played it in turn number one. Second blue for me, you're on the board. That means I can start countering spells, which is always difficult for an opponent. Attacking here with the Lanawar, and I'm just taking the damage, going to drop down to 19 and drawing for turn here and it looks like Eric has missed his land drop so that's that's painful and I'm tapping three here what am I gonna do tapping four and there's a jam day tome so that means I can start drawing cards next turn and let's see if Eric can finally find a land here he's missed one land drop of course he does have the Lunar Elves so he will still have four mana available if he can find his land this turn Remember, he's also playing with red, but he just doesn't have any red mana. And it looks like he's missed his land drop again, yuck. So he's being stuck on two lands, that's always tough. Attacking me again, I'm on 18, I'm playing an island out here. The question is, can I do something? Obviously hoping to draw into a Surrender Perfreet, but next turn I'll probably have six mana to my disposal, so that means I can start casting a Ma Moti Jin, and that would be a huge problem for Eric. Staring down at just two forests. And it looks like I'm passing turn here, pointing out that I've dealt a point of damage here with the Lunarer. So he's dropping to 19, untapping, and attacking again, it seems. Dropping to 17. And no land drop again. And of course, I'm going to draw an extra card at end step. And now drawing a card for my draw phase. Wow, I now have six lands. Am I going to play out a Mahamoti Jin? It looks like I'm not. I'm just attacking here 18, so I cannot find a big creature. I'm really looking for a payoff here. Something to sink all my lands in. Well, I've got the Jam Day Tome, of course, drawing an extra card again at the end of my turn. Look at that unstable mutation attacking here with a 4-4. Four -four. Wow, so that means I really can't find any of the big flyers I've got in my deck. Look at that, finding a land for Eric, and there is a War Mama 3-3 three, three Trample. And it actually comes at exactly the right time because next turn there will be a minus one, minus one counter from the Unstable Mutation. That's actually happening right now. That means my Lunar Elves is now a 3-3 three, three creature, no longer a 4-4. Four, four. And that means that Eric, if he wants to, he can trade it for his War Mammoth if I decide to attack. And of course, I'm hoping for him to trade, but he's not doing it. He's too smart. He's dropping here to 11. And I'm actually putting a Giant Growth on here. Wow. 
that means it's going to drop to eight. So pretty aggressive move, but also a move that shows that I don't have much going on in my hand at the moment. So even though my hand's pretty full because of the jam day tome, oh, look at this, there's a shatter on my tome. Using it one last time to draw a card here. Don't have a counter spell, obviously. That's a really good shatter here from Eric, who's found his mountain and he can start casting his red spells. Now, not attacking with his war mammoth. That means it's probably on blocking duty. My Lano Elves is gonna drop to two, two here because of the other minus one, minus one counter swinging in now. And is he willing to trade? There's always the danger of another giant growth. But then again, he's on eight. So probably he kind of feels the need to block. And look at that. He's putting his Lanor Elf in front of the bus. So the Lanor dies. And there is a regrowth on the Jam Day Tome. And I'm playing it out after that. Look at that. So that's my Jam Day Tome is back on the board here. That's pretty good news for me. Second Mountain found. And look at that playing a often troll, 2-2 two, two, regenerate for one red, attacking here with the war mammoth. I'm dropping to 13. And is Eric gonna do something else? Tapping two. Oh, look at that orcish artillery. Now the cool thing is about orcish artillery is that the alpha version is only one red and one. So if you play the beta or the unlimited version, it's actually two red and one to cast. But the alpha version is only one red and one. And I think if you play the alpha one, you can you can pay that casting cost now what the card does itself you can tap it it deals two damage to any target but also three damage to you so it's not ideal and look at that a surrender a freak here from my side of the battlefield right on time because my lunar elves is about to die here so that means i can start dealing some damage but also look at the uh the army that eric has there the question is is he going to attack and if if so does he have a giant grove to kind of kill my surrender and look at that. Wow. Gauntlet of Might. That means that all his red creatures, I believe, get plus one, plus one. And there's a counter spell. Oh, wow, wow, wow. I think Eric could have actually maybe even win the game if he uh, if that card would have uh, resolved. And look at that. In response, he's using his Orcish Artillery to kill my Lana Elves. And I'm using my Tome one last time. But that does mean that Eric is going to drop from eight all the way down to five. And is he going to attack now with his Often Troll and with his uh, War Mammoth? That is, I guess, the big question. And he's not doing it. Not willing to trade the War Mammoth for the Surrender. I'm dropping to 12 here. I'm going to put him on two probably. That means next turn he can deal some serious damage, but I'm playing a Birds of Paradise and that's probably on chump duty. And I'm tapping some more here. And look at that, playing a Rocket Launcher. And Rocket Launcher is actually pretty good when you play it in a deck that doesn't have any direct damage. Hello, oh, playing an Unstable. And I'm actually pointing out that I'm being pretty stupid here because I could have cast the Unstable on the Surrender per Free, but I'm actually double stupid because I also could have used the Rocket Launcher to actually win the game on the spot because he's only on two, but hey, I don't think it matters much. Oh, look at that. Wow, a Rock of Courageous. What a beautiful card. Great to see that hitting the board here. The 3-3 three, three Flyer, but the art of this card is amazing. And the Rock of Courageous actually has a pretty big part in the Antiquities lore. It's quite interesting. And now I'm saying, oh yeah, I can use my Rocket Launcher to actually win the game. And that's it. That's game number one. But I'm really looking forward to see more of this beautiful deck of Eric. So we're, we're definitely going to continue. We're going to dive into our sideboards and then we'll catch up with you in game number two. Game number two. And uh, it's 1-0 for me. But what a great deck here from Eric. I mean, I also like my deck. I really love the revised only brews. Uh, let's have a look here, Eric. Oh, look at this card, Illusionary Mask. Um, <laughs> this this card is a rules nightmare. Um, it's a poly artifact, meaning you can use it multiple times. I believe, uh, yeah, two to cast. Uh, you can pay X and then you can cast a card from your hand. Um, and then you have to turn it face down on the battlefield and when it attacks, it flips. And I believe the X actually has to be um, the mana cost of the creature, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I think that's what we're probably discussing right now, what that card means. 
and I'm showing that I have a counter spell, but I can't counter the card because he's actually not playing it. He's or he's not casting it from his hand. So this is really cool. He's working around my counter spell this way, and I guess it means that he now has to cast a creature that has the casting cost of two. He cannot say, okay, I'm just gonna pay two and cast, for example, a crawl worm, and then when I want to turn it face up because when he attacks or when it becomes stabbed or targeted he has to turn it face up and then he has to pay the, the remaining casting cost but i believe but please let me know in the comments below and let's just see what's going to happen in this game uh, and what rule sets we applied here uh, there's a lot of elves into the game the one one again and uh it's not looking very impressive from my side of the game thus far and there is an Orcish Oriflame. Again, one of those cards is actually cheaper to cast from Alpha. And he's attacking here. Look at that turn. The Grizzly Bear is flipping it up. And the Grizzly Bear is turned into a 3-2, dealing 3 damage. I'm going to drop here to 17. That is really sweet. I really love the tech here that uh, Eric is showing. And I wonder why I didn't uh, counter the Oriflame. On the other hand, I mean, it's not... That big of a deal. And I guess we're now discussing the rules again. And I think that um, what Eric told me here is because he was very open. I think we both were kind of trying to figure out how this card worked. He said, you know, I've paid two to cast it uh, face down. And now I'm attacking with it. So I've got to flip it. But I've already paid the two for it. So I don't have to pay the casting cost again. I do think that that's correct. Let me know in the comments below. Um, and look at that double birds of paradise. That's not really going to help me though. I mean, I've got a lot of birds. Hopefully next turn I can cast a Mahamoti Jin. I mean, the deck is called the Plan Jin. Where are my Mahamoti Jin? So let's see. Um, is Eric going to use his illusionary mask again? It does look he's, he has some mana issues again. We also saw that in game number one. And let's see what Eric's going to do. Attacking him for three, dropping to 14. Paying two more, and and there's another creature. I, does it come, exactly, it doesn't come tapped into play, does it? So now it's actually 2-2. Two, two. When it's face down, it's considered a 2-2. Two, two. But as soon as it blocks, I believe it, it flips face up. Oh, Illusionary Mask, what a wonderful card. One of those beautiful old school cards. I mean, it's like there's a whole novel in the rules box of Illusionary Mask. Attacking here actually with my 1-1, one, one, trying to force my opponent here to uh, to block with his flipped creature. He's not doing it though. And I'm playing a Surrender Perfect 3-4 Flyer, the powerhouse. Feels a little bit like cheating against an Alpha deck, but on the other hand, I'm, I've also restricted myself only playing. Ooh, Double Bolt on the Surrender. That is pretty sweet. From Eric here, attacking again with the Grizzly Bears. And what I wanted to say is I've also restricted myself only playing here with revised cards. And uh, tapping is there. And oh, no, 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 there's not. There's not a Stranded Perfect. There's an Energy Flux. I, I kind of, why am I, I guess I really have no other play. Because that means probably the Illusionary Mask is going to go. And look at that, Eric already drew his card. But in his upkeep, he has to decide if he wants to pay two for the Energy Flux. Energy Flux, a card originally from Antiquities that reads all artifacts get an upkeep cost of two. And if you don't pay two, they're actually destroyed. And look at that, he's paying two extra to pay for the Giant Spider. And oh, this is so confusing. Like we're, we're, we're <laughs> having some issues communicating here because Eric thinks he has to take a spider away. I don't think that when the mask disappears you have to take the spider away i do think because i've been reading up a little bit on the rules of the illusionary mask that eric couldn't have actually cast the giant spider because you can only you need the x you need to pay for the actual casting cost of the creature or more that's what i believe and then you have to put it face down on the battlefield look at that a mahamo Jinnia from my side of the board putting some pressure on finally being able to cast the mahamo Jin with the deck that's called the plan Jin. oh Look at that Raging River. Oh, that's such a cool card. That's so nice. Raging River is an enchantment um, from Alpha. And um, I believe when I attack with ground creatures, I've got to choose a side of the river, the left, left side or the right side. 
Um, and then my opponent can, can choose where he wants to put his creatures. And also when he attacks, I have to place my, my creatures on one side or the other side of the river, the left or the right. And that way you can kind of make your creatures unblockable in some kind of crazy way, but it doesn't apply to um, flying creatures, unfortunately for my opponent, Eric. So it doesn't apply to my Mahamoti Jin. He is still on 17 though, and I'm only on eight. So he's got some time. And if I'm gonna swing in with the Mahamoti, um, I can actually expect a grizzly bears and a giant spider to try and attack me. Of course, I can use my birds, I guess, to chum block. And I also have my Lunara elves. The question is, do I want to do that? Remember my opponent, of course, playing with red. So I can expect some direct damage here as well. And he's playing with giant grove. So it's a little risky. Anyway, attacking here with the five, six, let's hope. Oh, there's oh, a berserk. He's actually putting a berserk on my Mahamoti Jin, but there's a counter spell on the berserk. Okay, so that means he's just gonna drop to 12 here and I'm putting another I guess you could say chump blocker here on the battlefield. And he's on eight right now. The question is, what is he going to do? I mean, I mean I'm mean, i on eight, sorry, uh, Eric is on 12. The question is, what is Eric going to do? Is he gonna attack full force, forcing me kind of to chump with my birds? Remember, he's got the Orcish Aura or Flames. So that means he can attack for six. Curious to see here what he's going to do. We'll have to wait. It looks like he's he's in the tank as well. He's got five lands, which is quite a lot. What is he going to do? But what a beautiful deck here from Eric. I mean, look at these cards. It's just fantastic. Another Orcish Aura Flame. That means his creatures are going to get plus two, plus oh for attacking. So we now have a 4-4 four, four Giant Spider when it attacks and a 4-2 Grizzly Bear coming at me. And of course, I'm going to chump here with my two birds. But uh, wow, it's it's looking difficult for me here. Remember, he also has an often troll now on the board and it looks like I'm attacking him. He's on seven, but next turn, I'm going to get a serious beating. Wow, I need creatures. Remember, I'm also playing with Surrender Perfreed, so the lower he gets me on my life total, that means that all of a sudden I cannot play out my Surrenders anymore. Attacking here, wow. These creatures, we've got a 4-2, a 4-2, and a 4-4. Four, four. That means I'm gonna drop to four lives here? I think attacking with the Mahamoti was a misplay, unless I can find an unstable or a giant grove. So, I mean, it's not a misplay. I guess you could say it was playing towards my outs, but look at this. Disrupting Scepter, playing an island. Oh no, another energy flux. And I think that means Eric is gonna win this one. I'm out of cards, Eric is out of cards. And uh, we're gonna let this uh, play out. And I'm showing him I'm out of cards. I am pointing at the energy flux. So he's tossing the disrupting scepter, of course, not willing to pay four for it. And that's it, wow. <laughs> oh, well done, Eric. You've survived a quick surrender of free. You've survived a Mahamoti Jin against you. Wow, I love seeing those Orcish Oriflames in action. And here you can see the actual power of, of, of these cards, a card you normally don't see, but it's it's actually pretty good. Of course, in Alpha, it's even better because it only costs one red and one to cast. Anyway, looking forward to game number three. Really, uh, really, really loving this deck of Eric. Game number three. Wow, and it's 1-1. One, one. I, I get to start here with a nice tropical island passing turn. And there's a mountain from Eric playing second blue source here, ready to counter. Let's see, there's a Raging River. I actually took a moment to read the rules of Raging River and um, okay, it works in a way when he attacks, so only when he attacks, I have to put my non-flying creatures on either side of the river. So on the left side or the right side, and then Eric can choose which way he wants to go. So for example, he can attack with the War Mammoth and then I can say, I'm gonna put my Lanawar Elves on the left side and then he can say, okay, if he's on the left side, I'm gonna go on the right side with my War Mammoth. So that is pretty funny. Uh, in the meanwhile, we're seeing an often troll being cast and look at that. Oh, a churn for Mahamoti Jin. This is what I want to do with my deck. Um, I love the way, by the way, how Eric's putting his uh, Raging River at the top saying, okay, the often troll is going to choose the side. Oi, oi, oi. Oh, that's so funny. Look at that again, the double bolt. He did that in game one uh, or game two. He's doing that in game three as well. Taking care of my Mahamoti Jin, attacking me here for two, gonna drop to 18. 
And it looks like I need some more firepower, but I'm not finding it at the moment. Another attack here by Eric dropping to 16. And so despite the two for one from Eric, it's actually been a pretty good deal. There we see an Orcish artillery, but there's a quick counter spell from my side and a Lunar else, but that's not really gonna help me against the uh, often troll. Attack with the often troll. So in this scenario, I would have to choose a side. <laughs> He's pointing out, pick a side, but I'm saying I'm not even trying to block. I, I should have picked a side. That would have been more fun. Really nice to see Raging River, man. Thank you, Eric, for bringing this uh, this cool deck to the table and showing these unique old school cards that you don't see as often because they haven't been reprinted after, I believe, Unlimited. So it's really nice. Attacking here with the Often Troll again, going to 10. And I'm really in trouble here, by the way. I mean, I don't think I'm going to make this. Look at that, an unstable mutation. Choosing to go oh, in response. Lightning Bolt. Wow, sweet two for one here from Eric. That's a classic. Ay, 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 I'm on 10 here. He's gonna attack me, gonna drop to eight. Playing an unsummon, at least that's something. Maybe I have a counter spell in hand now. And yes, I do. So that's also a two for one from my side. <laughs> Very classic, classical magic here. It's actually quite nice to see. Birds of Paradise hitting the board. I don't really need the land, but okay. Tapping five. Oh, wow. This is the two-headed giant. Oh, this is such a cool card. It's a four-four. Um, it's got trample, so I cannot really chum block with my birds. I, at least I can do that, but it's only going to save one damage. And it can actually block not one, but two creatures and also decide how the damage, uh, how the damage from the giant is being divided. So it's actually, it's a pretty good card. And it's really nice to see. It's one red and four, so it's also very easy to splash when you're playing with two or three colors. It's, it's actually a pretty solid card here. Oh, look at that. I'm on one life after that fireball. Am I going to die here? That's not going to help. Maybe if I have a giant growth. Passing turn here. So the birds is now at three, four. So at least I can block and I can actually survive one more turn, I guess, because of the four toughness. Having to block no giant growth. Giant growth could have kind of helped me here. Uh, disintegrate for one. Do I have a car? No. <laughs> I, was just, I was fooling with you here, Eric, but wow. Thank you so much for these matches. And I'm actually kind of happy that you've won showing the power of these basic alpha decks. I mean, you just have pure, pure gas. And uh, my deck is um, just like your deck, I guess, linear. But wow, impressive, man. This victory is really nice. And of course, a combination of a lot of creatures and direct damage just works, works very well. Thank you, Eric, uh, for this game. Let's take another look at his deck. Let me know in the comments below if you've actually played against Illusionary Mask. And if so, what are the exact rules of Illusionary Mask? Um, and is it correct what I was saying that you can only cast uh, a card that you can actually, with Illusionary Mask, I guess you're not casting it, but you can only put a card, a creature card um, on the board, turned upside down, that you can actually pay the mana off. So the X has to be the amount, the casting cost, of the creature or more, so it cannot be less. Uh, and then when uh, it becomes a target of a spell or attacks or blocks or becomes tapped, then you flip it, you turn it face up again. So um, yeah, let, let me know if you're an illusionary mask expert. I'm sure there are many listening to this channel, many lovers of old school magic who have played against illusionary mask. Uh, this was actually my first time, so that's why I'm asking, of course, I'm aware of the card. I think it's uh, it's a stunning card, just like Raging River, which is another card that I've actually played against before, but I don't see that often. Okay, um, as for the game, again, Eric, congratulations. And Eric is actually a patron of Timmy Talks. And if you also want to become a patron, help the show, help Timmy Talks, the channel grow, uh, you can do so by clicking on the link that's appearing right now. And that will take you to my Patreon page. And there you can check out how you can support me and uh, yeah, who knows, maybe we'll also play a game of Magic the Gathering in the very near future. Uh, for now, thank you very much for watching. And let's go to the end scroll and take a look at the fantastic, amazing patrons of Timmy Talks. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?